Hi guys, we're going to talk about anything, what makes an animal an animal today. So we're going to talk about the four characteristics first. The four characteristics are going to be multicellularity, which means the animal has more than one cell. That means amoebas and bacteria and viruses, they are not animals because they only have one cell. Anything with more than one cell has different types of cells, so they're specialized and do certain jobs. They have cell junctions, which means they actually the cells each talk to each other, and the cells adapt based on what they need to do. Uh, all animals are heterotrophic. Heterotrophic means to get food from a different source. Hetero means different, and you can remember this from heterosexual and homosexual. Homo means same, so you like somebody of the same sex. Hetero means different, so you like somebody of a different sex. So hetero means different, and trophy indicates food. So this is getting food from a different source. And so we eat. We Animals in particular are ingestive heterotrophs. We put food into our body. There are some that actually absorb absorptive heterotrophy, but that's not an animal. Those are fungi. Another thing that makes animals animals are sexual, is sexual reproduction, so taking an egg and a sperm and putting them together to make a new animal. Um, the Sexual reproduction is really important in animals, um, in the diversity of animals, because it means animals aren't ever cloned. You're never an exact copy of um, one of your parents. So we have a lot of variability in um, our genetic makeup, which means that we all have different strengths and weaknesses, so we it keeps the species more fit, the animal, well, and the animal kingdom more fit. And the last thing that makes animals animals is movement. All animals move either internally or externally through muscle and nervous tissue. Now, specifically, a sponge is considered an animal, and it does not move outward, but it does move water through its body, so it does count. In fact, as we go through these, you'll notice a sponge is going to be kind of barely an animal. And one day I'm thinking maybe they will come up with a new category for a sponge because they have more than one cell, but they're all the same. Um, and they do get food in, so they are heterotrophic. That one's real. They do have sexual reproduction, but they also have asexual reproduction. And then they also, like I said, they do not move externally. They only move internally. All right. So the first animal we believe came from this aggregation of flat, um, flagellate prot protists. Protists are single cell organisms, and we believe that a bunch of them started living together. And as they lived together, the ones on the outside were the ones that grabbed food, and the ones on the inside were the ones that made energy. And so the cells started working together and changing, and then they couldn't live without each other. They needed the outer versus the inner. So the first animal would have come from these flagellated protists that started living together. There are 11 phylum of animals. 10 of them are invertebrates. Most of the animals in our world are considered invertebrates. They do not have a vertebrae. They have some sort of external vertebrae or external skeleton, uh, or they don't have anything at all. There is only one um, vertebrate phyla, and we, but we end up, when, we, when I say animal, you probably think dog, cat, fish, and you're thinking vertebrate. So we don't tend to think about the invertebrates because they're not as obvious in our world. They're much smaller, but um, most of the animals in our world are invertebrates. All right, so here is a picture. Down here, this is a, a uh, phylogenetic tree, sorry. Um, so down here is a protist. A protist was not an animal. Animals developed right after protists. So from here up is protists. Let me put on my pointer. So from this line up, they're all animals. You have sponges, which I told you about. They're not, they don't fully fit the animal kingdom, but they fit as close as possible. Then you have the cnidarians and tenophores, the jellyfish and the sea anemones. And then you have the flatworms, the planarians. And then you have the chordates and the echinoderms. The chordates are going to be where we fit in. The vertebrates, we're all chordates. Notice that the closest relative to us, because based on how close the branches are, is how close really related, is going to be a starfish. So anything that's not in the chordate or vertebrate, well, vertebrates more closely in the chordate, but we'll get there, um, 
the, our most closely related ancestor is going to be a starfish, which is kind of crazy. We also have roundworms and rotifers, mollusks, and round um, annelids, which is the segmented worms, and arthropods. And we're going to spend most of our time in the beginning of this class talking about arthropods, the phylum arthropoda. Then we are going to spend the rest of our time talking about the phylum chordata. So we in this class only talk about two phyla, arthropoda and chordata. We only talk about one kingdom. This is a zoology class. It's a class about animals. So we are only talking kingdom animalia. And in the beginning of the school, of the school year, phylum arthropoda. Anything after that is going to be phylum chordata. All right. Animal bodies are placed in a groups based on their morphology, and by that I mean structure. So however they're structured is going to place animals where they need to go. And that structure can be internal or external. It can be the organization at the tissue level. There's a lot of things that can go into this. Symmetry is a big one. So symmetry is defined as a consistent overall pattern of structure, and there are three kinds we're going to talk about. Radial, bilateral, and asymmetrical. Radial is when you can make two identical halves from cutting more than one way. Bilateral is you can cut one way and get two identical halves. We are bilateral. Asymmetrical would be like a sponge where if you, no matter how you cut it, you are not getting two identical halves. So here is some type. Uh, take a second. You have radial, bilateral, and asymmetrical. What kind do you think these are exhibiting? If you said radial, you are correct. So in the case of the sea anemone, I could cut here and here and here and here and get identical halves. In the case of the flower, I can cut here and here and here, and I can get identical halves, or close to identical. They don't have to be exactly perfect, but pretty darn close. All right, how about this one? Again, radial, bilateral, or asymmetrical. If you said asymmetrical, you are correct. These are sponges. Sponges, no matter how you cut them, they're just never going to have two identical halves. And how about this one? Radial, bilateral, asymmetrical. And if you said bilateral, you are correct. You can cut down the middle and make oops, sorry, two similar halves. We know that identical is not always exactly happen. Like you may have one ear that's a little bigger, but you're pretty darn close. And that's all that matters here. All right, the next thing we're gonna talk about is describing the areas of the body. So in zoology, we talk about a four-legged animal more often, and here's my little duck. If you say dorsal, you're talking about the top or back. So dorsal. If you say ventral, you're talking about the belly, ventral. If you say anterior, you're saying head side. And if you say posterior, you're saying butt side. So dorsal, ventral, anterior, posterior. Um, now with a two-legged animal, like a human, anterior and dorsal, head and front, are now the same. And um, ventral, or, I'm sorry, Ventral and anterior are the same. Dorsal and posterior are the same. Sorry for my misspeak. Um, the last term for this is going to be cephalization. If you notice, having a distinct head is cephalization. So a place where there's a big brain is cephalization. Um, if you can look at an animal and know which side is its head, it has some sort of cephalization. An earthworm doesn't have a high degree of cephalization, but you can tell where its head is based on its clitella and that smooth part. So you can still tell, but it's not super obvious. You have to look a little bit. Um, but if you were to look at um, a planaria, well, no, planaria, you can see their head pretty good too. Uh, well, a sponge, a sponge does not have a high degree of cephalization. So. And here's a picture of what I've just showed you with my little ducky here. Dorsal is the back, ventral is the belly, Anterior is the head, posterior is the butt. All right, I'm going to leave that here today. So today we talked about what makes an animal an animal. We talked about the types of symmetry, and we talked about the axes of the body. All right, I will see you guys later. Have a great day.